Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar where we'll be discovering what's next for education and technology. I'm Dr Chloe Ward, I'm an RMIT Research Fellow and I'm also host of the podcast Barely Getting By and I will be your moderator today. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders, past, present and emerging. And while we conduct our work remotely, I want to pay my respect to the wider unceded lands of, our, of this nation. Today, listeners will have the opportunity to submit questions to our speakers by entering them in the question panel on the right. Please feel free to send these in at any time during the event and we'll try to address them at the end. This webinar is being recorded and it will be sent by email with the slides after the event. The world of education is evolving. We need look no further than the impacts of the pandemic on remote learning to observe the social impacts of this change. For my part, before I started RMIT last year, I worked for three years with postgraduate online learners. And for me, I've always looked at online learning as an opportunity, not least to address equity in education. And I'm hoping to ask our presenters some questions about this in a moment. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, I've been keenly observing how educators have strived to make learning online, not just a substitute or a replacement for face-to-face -face learning, but an integral part of education with strengths all of its own. But of course, this has come with enormous challenges and under circumstances that weren't of our choosing. Our guest speakers today have all been at the forefront of both these opportunities for innovation and the challenges that come with them. We're privileged to be joined today by leaders from both public and private sectors who are working at the nexus of education and technology. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our guest. First of all, uh, Jackie Coates, so I'm going to ask to introduce herself. Hi everyone, and thanks for that great context setting, Chloe. Um, look, my name's Jackie Coates. I'm heading up the Telstra Foundation, and this is Telstra's charity, and we're really interested in two things. We like to look at social innovation enabled by tech, so getting great social outcomes through using tech, and also looking at STEAM and what the opportunity is to make sure that every single young person gets access to learning about STEAM and subjects and having a really great education experience. Thanks. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce Michelle Stockley. Hi Chloe and good afternoon everyone, delighted to be here. I'm the Head of Learning at the National Gallery of Victoria and in my role there I work with a team of educators who provide learning programs for learners of all levels uh, in education from early years right through to the tertiary sector. So looking forward to the discussion today, thanks Chloe. Great, thanks so much, Michelle. And last, but of course, not least, we have RMIT's own Linda Knight. Thank you, Chloe. Yes, my name is Linda Knight and I'm an Associate Professor here at RMIT in Education. Uh, my specialisations are in early childhood creative practice and digital media, so I'm very excited to be here with this uh, amazing panel. Um, and um, I'm interested in uh, uh, children's use of interactive media primarily. Great, thank you so much Linda and without any further ado let's dive into some questions. First of all my questions and the first of these I'm going to send Michelle's way first of all and that is what impact can technology and education have for hands-on industry learning? Good question Chloe. Uh, I think in an era where technology permeates almost every aspect of our lives and every industry, we have a great responsibility as educators to uh, really uh, make students aware of the relevance, uh, uh, the application, the practical application and also the incredible potential of technology in all learning areas. Even in an art museum where the main work that we do with learners is in gallery spaces, uh, engaging students with uh, art and design, there's abundant opportunity to explore the intersections between art, science and technology. Some of the most uh, interesting stories that we can actually share with the learners in, in the gallery come to us from our conservation team. Uh, they do enormous work behind the scenes uh, preparing works for display in the gallery and they 
their work involves a really fascinating blend of um, art and STEM, including really innovative use of technology to care for the works and, and to get them ready. People don't often think of, as, uh, of an art museum as having employees where STEM skills are really critical, but certainly art conservation is one area. And of course, I think it goes without saying that artists and designers through history have always embraced um, technology in creative ways and really important that we um, introduce students to uh, technology as a tool for creative problem solving and expressing ideas. I've got one slide here that we might prop up. Um, if we can. In our forthcoming NGV Triennial Exhibition, uh, we are showcasing the work of many international and Australian artists and designers who are at the cutting edge of technology. And one of them, in fact, is Dr. Pirio Hakala, who is a research fellow and lecturer at RMIT. And she's done some really fascinating work in uh, commercialising um, the uh, products of sea urchins who have a very devastating impact on the environment and in her work for NGV Triennial that you see here she's actually 3D printed a coral landscape using uh, the shells and spikes of sea urchins and this new material is actually showing great potential for a restoring coral reefs and so introducing students to inspiring stories of how technology is applied in a practical way, I think is really important. And I think, Linda, you had some further ideas to add in this context. I do. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Um, so I'll kind of speak from the uh, young person's perspective, if you like. Um, and uh, really, I think we can be inspired by what young people are already very confident in doing and their familiarity with technology. Um, and it's not a kind of mesmerized uh, familiarity. They're very, they're very hands on and they're not, they're not so kind of uh, precious, if you like, with technology. So um, I've seen young people uh, use different methods like hacking or pimping and tinkering with technology uh, to make devices and software and apps, etc., do exactly what they would like it to do rather than what it is uh, expected to do. Uh, uh, and that they will push the technology to make it more useful and for longer. So I've seen students, particularly undergraduate students, for example, use phones that are literally held together with tape um, and laptops that have virtually no screen um, uh, and use them together through like Bluetooth uh, connectivity. So one part of one bit of technology and another part of another bit of technology work together. Um, to kind of put them to the test, if you like, and use them really creatively. Um, and so these devices and technology are kind of really manipulated and, uh, and connected to make a kind of a larger device in essence. Um, and, and they use them to generate the most amazing interactive creative work. So, um, for example, I've seen um, young people design and program objects uh, that are light and sound responsive uh, when people move with them uh, and the tech that they've done that with has been really on its last legs so i think young people aren't so swayed by the marketing they have a kind of confident relationship uh, with technology and this uh, a kind of maker approach if you like to technology and I actually think that will have an impact on industry learning uh, in ways that we're already seeing through kind of the emergence of tiered products now you know and the reuse of components and things like more basic functionality in, in like grades of phones for example so yeah they're, they're my uh, observations. Thanks Linda and I think that's a really good reminder of something that comes up in my own work which is that users are innovators as well and students can be innovators as well in the way that they use technology. My next question is about the spaces where learning is taking place. So I'm going to direct this one to Michelle first again, and that's as education is decentralised from classrooms or lecture theatres, what opportunities to learn could there be in different settings, for instance, art galleries or public spaces? 
Great. Thank you, Chloe. I think museums are really unique learning environments in an increasingly diversified learning landscape, and our collections and exhibitions provide really rich opportunities for engaging learners with a whole range of subjects and ideas. And learning experiences can take many different forms within those sort of settings. So at a place like the National Gallery of Victoria, it could be a playful interaction of children within a kids exhibition. It could be school groups engaging in discussions and activities in a workshop or in gallery spaces, but it could also be adult learners undertaking courses, tours or in fact workshops themselves. So, so many um, different possibilities. Um, as we've seen during COVID-19, which I think has been really exciting, is that learning from a museum can also take place entirely in the digital realm. It doesn't have to involve a, a, a on-site visit, although we do love it when people do those. Um, and I think that it, online learning, as, as in fact you were, as uh, Linda was saying before, uh, plays a really important role in um, extending learning opportunities to new audiences. I mean, not unexpectedly this year, we've seen a great uptake of our live educator-led virtual excursions and 17% of schools participating in those are engaging with the gallery for the first time and they're often coming from remote and regional locations and that's very exciting for us. It's also important, I think, that places like galleries uh, provide options for how people learn and so digital resources that can be accessed at any time and anywhere are very important and they also play a very important role in uh, serving learners who for whatever reason may not be able to physic physically visit the gallery or, or need to have learning presented in different ways. So I think they're just a few of the ways I feel uh, museums can um, provide uh, learning opportunities but again Linda I feel like you have some thoughts here as well. I do, I do. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, um, I think there are heaps actually, heaps of ways in which uh, we've got some opportunities presented to us. Um, and I know perhaps uh, if there are uh, people in education listening that they might be a little bit kind of alarmed by this and it decentralisation does sound scary from an education perspective, but um, you know, and it's understandable that there might be a fear that we're losing something through decentralisation. Um, I'd like to kind of put forward a pro uh, kind of provocation, if you like, that we can shift the focus perhaps from disciplinary learning, such as the kind of curriculum subjects, to a kind of focus on materials and interfaces uh, when we're outside the classroom or lecture hall. Uh, and this shift uh, brings different modes of organisation of learning. So from subject specific to technology or interface specific. Uh, and so we need to kind of remember that uh, technology refers to anything that aids us as well. So technology needn't be a smartphone. It could be a, um, a pencil, a length of rope, a spade. Uh, and likewise, interfaces can be uh, electronic or vegetal or geologic or topologic. Um, so learning can be accessed through these kind of lines of connectivity, uh, such as through digital networks, but in relation to these very diverse uh, technologies and interfaces. Um, so, for example, being somewhere like a sports stadium or a cultural institution, as you were just talking about there, Michelle, um, a library, even a public mall, a shopping mall, uh, learning can can take place in relation to history, geography, sociology, cultural studies, science, etc., by connecting to those networks and digital functions in those places. So, I think that a shift, perhaps a provocation around the shift from the disciplinary to the kind of materiality could be where we're going and it could be a, a possible future for us in, in, in ideas around decentralisation, but without losing any quality of education. Thanks, Linda, and thanks, Michelle. Um, Linda, I really wish that I'd had those very astute observations on hand when I started my journey in online learning a few years ago. But of course, as you alluded to, there are challenges that come with this shift into digitalization and into online. So I thought I'd ask Jackie about those barriers. So what sort of barriers does online learning present currently and how can online learning increase social equity for learners, say, in rural and remote regions? 
Oh, look, it's a really great question and so timely, right? Because with COVID-19, you know, it essentially everything was accelerated to the digital world. And what it threw up for a lot of people was issues. It really put the spotlight on them. And for example, you know, it, it underlined this critical importance of digital inclusion and that digital exclusion is a key barrier to online learning. And so Telstra does a lot of work in this space. We've commissioned some research. Um, it's published as the Australian Digital Inclusion Index, and it really paints a story about what the digital inclusion um, health of Australia looks like and where we're seeing the gaps and you know the gaps are are there and whilst you know digital inclusion is increasing in Australia it's certainly widening and getting a little bit deeper in some some cohorts and particularly low income families so when we think about online learning you know I always think about at those foundational level barriers you know we have to address access we have to make sure that you know people you know know and have have access to the internet they have devices they can use they know how much data they can use and this certainly was an issue when schools went into homes and had to be you know basically flipped to online learning we saw a lot of issues with access where kids just didn't have that equipment and things like affordability you know we have to start thinking well you know how much data are we going to get for our dollar how much do we spend on internet services as a proportion of our income in the household and then also digital ability which is all about you know our skills levels and you know what we actually do with um when we're online and our attitudes towards technology and our confidence in using it. So those three things are really kind of key, can be key barriers to online learning. And it's something that I think, you know, definitely through COVID we've had a real spotlight on. No, that's absolutely true. And I'm fascinated by those remarks, Jackie, and I'm really looking forward to reading that report. So I hope that we can get access to that. Most um, likely. Oh, I forgot to answer your equity question. <laughs> yeah, no, no, look, I, there's another one coming up, which is a little bit more specific. And okay. I was going to ask Jackie and then Linda to answer this one. And it's how do you believe digital learning can benefit our deaf, vision impaired or our ageing communities? Oh, look, I think, you know, the magic word here is accessibility. Um, having accessible digital learning is a game changer and our RMIT has a deep commitment to accessibility which is great and we you know we need to think how e-learning is designed, how communication is handled, you know do we have Auslan translators inbuilt into the e-learning offer, do we have remote live captioners, um, you know are all the learning materials being able to be read by just simple screen readers you know all those kind of issues I think we need to consider when we're designing an offer and also um, you know a lot of people might have mobility issues in terms of navigating a campus so e-learning is a great opportunity to um, you know and offer some benefits there in terms of not having to worry about that challenge and I think for the aged also you know online learning can be a wonderful way to counteract that social exclusion that many of our seniors in society do feel and and, you know, if we can get past that digital literacy and sort of build the confidence and skills to go online, it, online learning can be a real game changer. I might throw to Linda. What do you think, Linda, about, about the potential? Yeah, I agree, uh, Jackie. I think there are lots of potentials. Um, and I think um, so uh, increasing people's digital literacy, I think, uh, as you say, is really, really important. Um, it's, it's an issue that has um, been at a forefront of my own thinking too in terms of um, people's access to digital uh, technologies um, and I guess the entry point I've made is through the kind of uh, ethics of the programming or the ethics of the algorithmic kind of uh, intelligence of those of those programs um, and perhaps might um, ask for a slide at this point um, because it uh, links to some work that I've done with um, a colleague of mine here at RMIT, Justina Leong. Uh, we formed a, an artist collective a couple of years ago called the Guerrilla Knowledge Unit. Um, and the point of that project was to get the public to think about the kind of ethics of access and the ethics of AI and who gets to be uh, included in those kind of um, uh, algorithms, if you like, or, or kind of access points. So we kind of engaged a number of public uh, uh, attendees to Ars Electronica a few years ago, which is a kind of new media festival in Austria. Um, and we got people to kind of interrupt the usual points of access that they would make with digital technology. So that was like their ears, eyes, fingers, mouths and so on. And the images you can see show them trying to interact with digital media and te different technologies with these kind of interruptions, these interface interruptions. 
Um, and what it allowed them to do was to think about um, in, in very simple ways um, how digital technology had a kind of um, limit. It had a limit point. And so um, I, I think it, it for us, it raised some really important kind of questions and ideas, which I'm sure will be addressed over time in terms of people's access and who gets left out in that point and what bodies are needed uh, and what those body capacities must be to actually interact with digital media. So some, some interesting questions we're looking at through the Gorilla Knowledge Unit. Right, thank you, Linda. Jackie, could you tell us something about Code Club and how it's impacting the way that young people engage with coding languages? Oh, for sure. I could talk forever about this initiative. I just love it. Um, so what Code Club is, it's a global movement to get kids coding. And in Australia, Telstra Foundation manages Code Club Australia. And it's a national network of free volunteer led coding clubs. And they're conducted in schools and libraries. And we have, I think, oh, it's like 2,200 clubs across the country. Um, lots of them are in remote and regional Australia, which is fantastic. And there's about 200,000 kids that sort of come through these code clubs. And the reason why it's so important, I think, is that, well, firstly, it's free. So it democratizes the opportunity to engage with code if you're a little bit curious about it. And, you know, what we try and do is give all the teachers and librarians free online teaching resources. There's professional development that's all free that you can access. If you've never coded before, it doesn't matter. We will show you how to teach code. You don't have to be a coder to teach code, which is really great. And I think for young people, what it does, it sort of helps take them out of that relationship with technology where you're just consuming it, you know, you actually can create it. And I think, you know, to the point that um, Linda was making, you know, how do we just get more people thinking about tinkering and thinking about creating with tech? And it gives lots of lots of skills as well. Logic, creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, all those sort of soft skills that we know are going to be absolutely part of the workplace of the future. I mean, it's here now. So that's that's what Code Club's about. And we're really passionate about it. Thanks, Jackie. I have a seven year old nephew who I think would be would be fascinated by that opportunity. I also, <laughs> I also have a four year old niece who is very technical mind, but we know that getting girls and women into STEAM subjects, into STEAM careers is, a, is an ongoing challenge. So I'll ask, I'll send this to Jackie's way first. How can tech address barriers of entry for women and girls who are interested in STEAM? Look, it's such a good question. You know, we want tech to be designed um, by diverse mix of experience. So I think, you know, the long term solution to women being uh, underrepresented in STEM or STEAM lies in fostering gender equality in the classroom. I think there's a really wicked underlying assumption that, you know, girls are less interested in STEM than boys. And it's really important that we don't fuel this because I think we're fostering a mindset in young girls before they've even been exposed to STEM and what that could mean. And research tells us that, you know, even girls as young as six start developing their gendered beliefs around intelligence. So it's really important. I mean, as a, someone that works in a tech company, that we work with educators and schools and parents and society to just spin this myth, get rid of this stereotype and hope that girls, you know, can carry on their studies. And I'm really proud that, you know, Code Club is 50% girls, which is fantastic. And I think, you know, for women in the workplace, we've also got to look at how do we tackle this boys club? Um, I'm sure this panel will have a few views on this being an all woman panel, but, um, you know, you know, we've really just got to look at, you know, if fewer women are studying STEM, it means there's fewer women in the field, which means that, you know, the sectors tends to be male dominated. And we've just got to be wary of that culture, that it's inclusive to both women and attractive to women and minorities. And lastly, you know, you can't be what you can't see. You know, we've just got to get better at telling stories and amplifying women that are in STEM, particularly Indigenous women working in STEM. Australia has some amazing Indigenous leaders working in STEM. So I think, you know, it's just all about amplifying and creating a visibility platform. What about you, Linda? You would have seen quite a bit of this in your yes. work. <laughs> I could not agree more. Um, and really, Jackie, I, I echo what you're saying. And I actually don't think we have a problem with women and girls not interested in STEM or STEAM in the young years as, uh, as we frame it. I think there are millions of girls and women uh, from from the very young, like even the under fives, and particularly we see very young children deeply engaged in STEM and STEAM learning to adults uh, inventing and excelling in tech and STEAM innovation every day. And I've just got some examples to add to uh, Jackie's girls who code, black girls code, 
Babble Dabble Do, which is a, a and Goldie Blocks, which are kind of uh, STEM based sites for educators. And then the example of uh, Xochitl Guadalupe Cruz Lopez, who last year at age nine won the highly prestigious ICN Women's Recognition Award for her design for a solar powered water heater using recyclable materials. I mean, just extraordinary. Uh, and then, of course, most recently in Australia, we've had the, the kind of uh, impact of uh, Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu and rethinking um, how particularly as, as white folks uh, think around uh, indigenous engagements with STEM. So I think if we keep saying that we have a problem with girls and women in STEAM, I, I actually think it, it we need to address uh, the STEAM subjects perhaps uh, and how they uphold biases and exclusions and privilege certain forms of knowledge. And, you know, STEAM can be a very white male zone. <laughs> so I think the issue isn't about bringing women and girls into that space because women and girls are in that space. I think it's about changing the space to acknowledge the diversity of people who are already interested in doing STEAM in all kinds of ways. I think I think we need to do that now. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Now, I'm very keen to get to the Q&A to give our audience a chance to take part in this event, but I do want to ask Jackie about Humanitech and Telstra's partnership with RMIT and the Red Cross. Yeah, sure. Look, um, Telstra has a great partnership with RMIT. You're one of our five education partners in Australia, and we work on lots of great things like micro-credentialing and do some really great things together. Humanitech is an initiative of Australian Red Cross that Telstra is the founding funder of. And what it's all about, it's a global think and do tank, and it really seeks to pioneer new digital solutions through, you know, collaboration and sharing. And it's looking at research and the lab and advocacy and, and influence. And it's fantastic. And it's actually, there's something very similar happening at RMIT, which is the Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society. This is an incredible collaboration project. RMIT is the host site. There's tons of other universities involved, lots of civic society, lots of not-for-profits, lots of tech sector involved, looking at you know, how can machine learning and blockchain be developed responsibly, ethically and inclusively. And I think this is a fabulous um, cornerstone to just show how education and industry can work together and really sort of redefine and reset how we use technology. So there's just a few things that are happening in that collaboration space. Thanks, Jackie. And I'm, I'm a little bit partial, but I have to say I'm very impressed since I've come to RMIT with how seriously it takes those partnerships. Michelle, could you tell me, I want to talk a little bit about institutions in Melbourne. So obviously Melbourne institutions like the National Gallery of Victoria have seen significant increases in tech embedded experiences for young people. How are young people engaging in these programs? I think the short answer is quite naturally and in a variety of ways. And it really starts with our kids exhibition, which really feature um, tech embedded interactives where kids can actually create things online, send them home to themselves. I also do really want to mention our Telstra Digital Creatives Program. And thank you, Jackie, to Telstra for your support of that. But uh, a key element of that program is uh, a coding pro a program that teaches basic coding skills through art. And I think that's really important. One of our most recent uh, iterations of that program introduced students to the artist Keith Haring and they were able to actually interact with his work. And it really teaches mathematical and computational thinking, but in a very creative um, context. So we're very excited by the opportunities that offers. Part of Digital Creatives also includes an app artist pixel painter program where kids use apps and technology on the ground in the gallery spaces to create their own work. And of course, online resources provide that anywhere, anytime learning that I think is really critical to you know, extending our reach and, and addressing some of the issues of equity that people have been speaking about. Thanks, Chloe. Uh, Linda, I think you have something to add, may have something to add. Yes, I do. I think, uh, again, I'll talk from an education perspective, and I think particularly for uh, Melbournians and Victorians more widely, um, we've had, um, you know, quite quite significant lockdowns and, and times at home. And I'm thinking of all those uh, families at home whereby uh, parents are balancing work as well as uh, looking after their children and, and helping their children do their school learning. Um, and so there's, it can be it can be a very kind of intense time for a lot of families at home. Um, but I actually think the kind of collections and particularly like the NGV have, 
are really offering lots of opportunity for parents and children to work together um, and to access collections together, but for different purposes. So, you know, it might, it's not just for the curiosity of what an, an interactive experience uh, digitally of the NGV might be like, but what kind of learning is going on and what can what kind of learning can the child be kind of assisted in uh, and experienced through those interactions. So um, and I've just got some uh, stats actually that are very encouraging in terms of Victorian uh, take up. The uh, Creative Victoria has this year been running a kind of Outlook monitor um, uh, kind of questionnaire or survey um, and uh, we still in Victoria have a higher than average, higher than national average engagement with uh, creative and cultural institutions. Um, and that doesn't seem to be impacted by the, uh, the, the, the online only option. So I think it's very encouraging and it, it to me it indicates that families are very keen to go into those spaces with their children um, to, to use them for all kinds of learning um, experiences. Thanks, Linda. Now we do have quite a few excellent questions that are coming through on the chat and a lot of them are actually expanding on the things that we've already talked about, which I think is great. The first of these I'm going to send Jackie's way and that's with the current shift to online education, how do we ensure that those without technology or internet access aren't further disadvantaged? For sure, look, that is a, a very big question. I think everyone has a role to play in making sure that you know we are a digitally included society. I certainly know like from Telstra's point of view, you know, we're looking at things like um, we've got a program called Access for Everyone, which sort of helps people with low incomes or facing financial hardships stay connected. Um, you know, that was a $46 million program. We did with the um, shift into home learning, you know, we, we supported over 200,000 young students to have access to the internet and make sure that they could get online at home. You know, I think it's just going to take a village approach to really focus in on this issue around digital inclusion and really look at, you know, how do we get those, those people where the gap is widening and deepening? What do we all have to do and contribute to, to making sure they're getting online? Um, yeah, but it is a really, really nutty problem. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Linda, this question's for you, and it's a long one, but I think it is a good one. So if we need to go back to it, please just shout out. <laughs> Do you think that the sometimes poor digital literacy of adults or parents might be detrimental to young people's online learning? And if so, how might we build the digital literacy and understanding of parents who are often only hearing the negatives about pe young people's time online? So that really, and then there's a second part of that, which is how do we balance inactivity and screen time with children? OK, so thank you. I'll, I'll answer the second one separately because I, I have something uh, that actually attends to that second point. Um, but I, I actually think it's about what kinds of uh, sorry, what kinds of digital um, engagement families are having and when they realise they're having it. So, for example, we know that there are interfaces, digital interfaces peppered throughout everyday life so that we look at digital interfaces to find when the train is, to locate ourselves in the mall, and to kind of find where in the library we need certain books. If we attend a hospital, we often are faced with digital interfaces that we kind of uh, interact with either ahead of visit or during the visit. And so I think um, perhaps it's not so much about um, a low um, literacy rate but a low awareness rate um, because I think most of us actually do interact with and certainly most of us have smart devices um, these days um, and, and many of us have more than one if we have like a tablet as well as a phone and a laptop and so on so I think um, I think the work is in actually making people aware of the volume of, of literacy that uh, digital literacy that they actually engage with on a daily basis and making them kind of confident that that it is every day. It's not necessarily a, a special thing that that they decide to have happen. Um, I think if we can uh, build people's confidence as adults in that sense, then hopefully they will they will have more confidence with working with their children in terms of the children's uh, digital or technology based learning. Um, 
And the second question is interesting. I've, um, I'll do a bit of a trumpet blow. <laughs> uh, I'm part of a, uh, uh, I was fortunate enough with colleagues at um, QUT in uh, Brisbane to be awarded a, an ARC discovery project uh, that we've just started, which is actually on young children's um, sustained activity while using novel technology. So um, we are just at the uh, beginning of that project, but the three year project will actually look at um, how we encourage young children, this is children under the age of five, to not sit down with a device when they pick it up, but to actually sustain their physical, creative, active play whilst using the devices. So you'll just have to watch this space to uh, look out for the outcomes of that one. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. I, I know a few parents, uh, particularly parents with kids who are obsessed with the ABC Kids program, Bluey, who will be interested in the results of that study. Um, so this one is for Michelle, because Michelle, you're very much working at the intersection of the concerns that raise this question, which is, do you think that technology in education comes at the detriment of soft skills? Yes, I think, and, and this builds really, Linda, on what you were saying, I think the uh, digital technology, obviously there's an incredible volume of ways in which people actually engage with digital technology, which encompass, I think, just about all of the soft skills. And so I think they're absolutely embedded in it, whether they're art making skills, but you know, I'm thinking of uh, collaboration tools that we use with technology uh, in working with um, students in the gallery. Uh, I'm thinking of the critical and creative thinking that students are involved with. Even in working with students online in a virtual excursion environment, the social and personal capabilities play into it in terms of the way they interact online and uh, work with each other. And so I, I, I feel really strongly that um, we can gain all of those skills and more through technology and it is about having that broader understanding of what technology actually is, not just thinking of it as something that's very um, worked on in a very narrow sort of way. I think that's a great response and to be a little bit a bit a bit homey and a little bit uh, vernacular about it, I'd say that my, my seven-year-old nephew I mentioned before, he plays a lot of Minecraft and what I'm astonished by is how social an experience that is. And Absolutely. it's all, sort, all sorts of skills. <laughs> so this question, I'm again going to send Linda's way. And it's, what are your favorite examples of interesting ways that educators are using technology to cut through the digital fatigue that everyone must be facing when so much of our life is spent on a screen right now? Thank you. They're, that's a really good question and I think it's useful perhaps uh, for people listening in if they are um, parents or um, you know not not in the field of education what what's happening in the classroom or what's happening in the kindergarten space and so two particular there's two particular ways of answering this question one is what is happening between educators and children and one and the other is what is happening um, in terms of what educators are doing for themselves. So uh, what educators are doing with children, for example, um, is using not necessarily um, uh, VR based uh, apps, uh, although they do use uh, virtual reality apps, but what's rising in popularity is the augmented reality apps. So these are things whereby it combines like film or video or children's voices or um, those kinds of um, kind of uh, just, uh, you know, human interactions, but with a kind of uh, added reality to it, an augmented reality to it. And I think that they're, they're becoming really, really popular. And so they are they kind of allow for a richer experience perhaps not so much of a passive experience where the child might be just swiping and clicking on a screen for example so that's 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 taking off in in uh, terms of the adult child interaction um, uh, teachers are using technologies really effectively and actually have been for some time so for example they're using things like swivel cameras which is a uh, a tracking camera a tracking app 
for the teacher to be um, able to do their everyday classroom work, but be filmed um, and so that they can kind of have an idea if they've got a question that or something that they're trying to look at in terms of their teaching, they're using technologies really effectively. We also know that teachers use those apps for online teaching, um, whereby children are remote they're you know, kind of thinking into the classroom remotely so lots they're they're, they're kind of my favorite that favorite things at the moment linda this question i'm also going to send your way and it's kind of building on that last one it's about the response to COVID 19. could you talk a little about innovation that has come from the forced transition to online learning in terms particularly of the learning outcomes for students so um i think I think what's incredible, first of all, I just like I, I just need to acknowledge the incredible work that educators have done in, in getting their kind of uh, asynchronous learning <laughs> on. Uh, many, not all schools have had all students uh, absent, as we know. So many, many, uh, and particularly kindergartens have had a mixture of attending and non-attending uh, uh, students. Um, which which means that in a kindergarten children are either not there or they are, but in school that means that the teachers are dealing with children in attendance and also children who are uh, remotely connecting. So um, I think I think some of the innovative ways really relates to what we we're talking about earlier in that they're kind of pulling from the resources that we have through cultural institutions through different learning institutions and museums um, and uh, uh, and using those really effectively and embedding them in the kind of learning that they that they're programming for for young people um, and I think that's really that's really innovative because they're not relying on their own knowledge solely as they might perhaps in a classroom situation they're actually directing children and families to to network um, and to connect with things not just in Australia but globally so I think there are some really I think educators really do need a very big pat on the back for for all that work that they've done this year and maintained absolutely absolutely you know they have maintained such great standards of learning uh, whilst doing this innovation but also working with their own children often at home as well um, as parents, but also helping their learning. So um, I think I think, yeah, taking up taking up the kind of resources, the digital resources that we have um, through cultural institutions have been some of the ways in which um, educators have kind of networked their learning with other other education providers, I think. No, I absolutely agree with you there, Linda, on you know the, the fantastic job that educators have done throughout the pandemic. And also to go back to my point earlier about users of technology, I think there's going to be a lot we can learn from their experiences, both the good and the bad. So one more question for Michelle, and I'm putting this in because I, I couldn't resist, um, but I will ask you to try to keep it a little bit brief because we've got to wrap up soon. Uh, with a lot of the mentions, the skills we've talked about being historically taught face to face, are these ideas and strategies that can be trans can be transferred to remote learning, especially with the likelihood that remote or hybrid learning will continue through parts of 2021? And this again builds on something that Linda just said, I think about the creativity of educators and I've seen with the team that I work with who are a team of teachers, how they have been very focused on maintaining some of the pedagogical imperatives that we have on site, including inquiry based learning, active learning uh, discussion in their uh, programming. So I feel that with increasing practice, we're just getting better and better at that. And, and I've certainly seen in this period of remote learning how those programs have uh, really transitioned to much more active ways of engaging that will foster those soft skills. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Michelle. So there's one more question which is coming from me as the chair. It's the chair's privilege. In just a few sentences and ask each of our panellists to answer this, perhaps beginning with Jackie, what transformations are you most excited about in the world of education? 
Oh, look, I really love this idea of the sort of taking that human centered design approach to what a learning experience of the future could look like for a young person and then sort of what role tech could play in that experience to just improve learning outcomes and just prepare our young people for the challenges they're going to face in the future, which will be completely different to many of the challenges that you know I faced when I was growing up. So I think um, that's something that really excites me. I'll ask Michelle the same question. Sure, thank you, Chloe. I'm really excited about the fact that we have an increasingly diversified learning landscape that really recognises the learning experiences that are offered beyond traditional institutions like schools and universities. And I think that's um, particularly exciting for places like museums when um, technology is harnessed to provide new forms of engagement and also to extend the reach of those learning opportunities. Great. And Linda, what are your thoughts? Thank you. Um, I think what excites me the most is that we're moving from this mesmerisation to a critical uh, use and we're thinking about the means of production of technology. So the social environmental ethics and the procuring of those materials and we're putting the tech to work a bit more thoroughly, I think, uh, and usefully. Um, and then I think I'm excited by the future for educators in terms of uh, pushing the capacity of technology a little more, uh, where education can take place, how they can network, it goes beyond the classroom, um, and that they're helping children main, maintain connections with different realities, but in ways that are critical and ethical and thinking about different types of digital futures. So that, that really excites me. Thanks so much, Linda, and thank you to all our speakers. I think this session, for me at least, and I hope for anyone who's attending, this has been really fascinating, it's been interesting, it's been invigorating in what has been, you know, a really challenging year, but also one that I can see is hopefully going to end in some really great income outcomes for um, education and online learning in particular. Um, so, we're going to wrap up there. If your question couldn't be answered today, please feel free to email your question through to, I'll give you the email address, but I'm sure we'll get sent through after, to campaigns at rmit.edu.au, and our team will try to respond as soon as possible. There is also a postgraduate session on education, which is coming up on Monday, the 26th of October, and I'm sure some further information will be sent out to you about that as well. And I guess that just leaves me to once again thank our panellists, to Jackie, Linda and Michelle, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar on the future impacts of innovation-based learning. Bye.